we intuitively understand that our volition is closely tied up with our consciousness, or the sum of all that we subjectively experience. Since we do not experience what lies outside of consciousness, we cannot volitionally shift our attention to it. Let's consider a bit more deeply why volition and qualia are so deeply connected. First, note that consciousness is bifurcated. We're conscious of the outside world in the form of perception, and we're conscious of our various internal simulations or imaginings, including dreaming, daydreaming, and hallucinations. Perception might be thought of as a kind of hallucination as well, but one that is constrained to be about what is most likely really happening in the outside world. Consciousness plays a key role in mental causation in providing a common format for endogenous attentional and other executive operations, which permit the assessment of possible behaviors and thoughts against highest level criteria for successful attainment of goals and fulfillment of desires. Subjective experience provides an executive summary to planning areas that can initiate voluntary motor outputs. Qualia are those representations that can be attended or are now being operated on by endogenous attention, giving rise to the possibility of volitional attentional tracking, which I argue cannot happen in the absence of consciousness. Because certain operations can take place only over conscious operands, whether of perceptual or imagined sorts, and motor acts can follow and enact the conclusions of such operations, such mental operations can play a necessary causal role in subsequent thoughts and motor acts. Because conscious operands are necessary for such volitional operations, consciousness is necessary for free will. No consciousness, no free will. Let's consider the case of conscious perception. Neuroscientist Stan DeHane and colleagues explored the neural bases of consciousness using a paradigm called the attentional blink. The attentional blink occurs when you have to identify a target in a rapid stream of potential objects, most of which are not the target. Identifying a first target makes it very hard to then identify a second, subsequent target within a brief window following the appearance of the first target. This period where the second target has trouble making it into consciousness is what is meant by the attentional blink. It is as if attending to the first target makes the mind blink for a fraction of a second, making it hard to process subsequent input in depth. Here's an example for you to experience firsthand. Your task is to identify the letter R in the upcoming stream of rapidly presented letters. In addition, after this, there will also appear a letter C after the letter R. Try to register that you saw an R and then also register that you saw a C. Okay, here goes. Many people report that they did not see the letter C after having registered the letter R. This is because the C falls within the attentional blink that was induced by having seen the letter R. Now, try it again with the exact same series of rapidly presented letters, but this time trying to see the letter C. Okay, here goes. This time, you probably had an easier time seeing the letter C. I think the attentional blink happens because attention has to transfer a letter from the visual system to working memory, during which time it cannot transfer another letter into working memory because the transfer to working memory itself takes time. A humorous metaphor for this is shown here where Lucille Ball is trying to wrap chocolates as they go by, but as she does this process, or steals chocolates by putting them into her mouth, she misses other chocolates as they go by. This is like consciousness missing the letter C after having registered the prior occurrence of the letter R in the letter stream. Notice, we never seem to notice that we have missed transferring something from the stream of visual input into the stream of our conscious experience. How could we be conscious of that which we are not conscious of? We don't have a second consciousness that is watching our primary consciousness saying, hey, you just missed that. All we have is our constructed consciousness of the world based on the continual stream of bottom-up input with no way to know how veridical it is in mapping events in the world as they really are. 
Claire Sarjan, Stan DeHane, and colleagues used the attentional blink paradigm in order to see the differences in brain response for those cases where people saw the second target and those cases where the second target did not make it into consciousness. They used words in their study instead of letters, but the main point is that they can compare identical stimuli, which in one case led to conscious experience of the second target, and in the other case did not. Any differences between these two conditions cannot be due to the stimulus, which was the same. It has to be due to the difference in processing that led to consciousness or not. Now we are going to walk through their electroencephalogram, or EEG results, at successive temporal steps. In the top case, you can see the EEG response when the second target did not make it into consciousness, and in the bottom case, you can see the EEG response when the second target did make it into consciousness. The colored areas are the parts of cortex that are likely to be the sources of neural activity that give rise to the EEG signals measured at the scalp, time-locked to the onset of the target. At 96 milliseconds after stimulus onset, the two cases look the same. This is the brain response associated with a particular EEG signal, or event-related potential, or ERP, called the P1 or P100, which is a positivity at about 100 milliseconds in the voltage of the brain measured through the scalp by EEG electrodes. The P1 is associated with bottom-up visual processing. At 180 milliseconds, the two cases still look the same. Now we can see the brain signature of activity associated with the N1, or N100. This is a negativity in the voltage signal measured at the scalp that occurs more than 100 milliseconds after stimulus onset. By about a quarter of a second after stimulus onset, things start to get really interesting. Now we can see that there is much more brain activity in the case where the target survived the attentional blink and was seen as compared to the upper case where it was not seen. In the case where it was seen, so in the lower case shown here, the activity is associated with the N2 signal. After 400 milliseconds from target onset, we can see a vast difference between the two cases. When the stimulus did not make it into consciousness, so in the above case, cortical activity has already begun to subside. Whereas in the case where the stimulus made it into consciousness, the frontal lobes appear to light up with activity. This activity is associated with the P3A signal, which is associated itself with stimulus-driven non-volitional attention. After half a second relative to the onset of the stimulus, in the case that is consciously seen, we see even more frontal activation and we see reactivation of the back of the brain in the occipital cortex where visual input first arrived in the cortex. This activation is associated with the P3B signal in the EEG, which is associated with volitional attention or perhaps the transfer of bottom-up input into working memory by volitional attention. In addition, the scientists had observers rank how confident they were that they had seen the target. This is the visibility rating shown on the lower left here. As you can see, the magnitude of the P3B event-related potential component varied with their confidence. The more confident subjects were that they had seen the target, the stronger the P3B signal. Now, what about the earlier N2, shown here? It also seems to vary in the lower right area labeled fusiform with confidence. As you can see, the more confident subjects were that they had seen the target, the higher the N2 component of the EEG signal. And here you can see the P3B in both the frontal and fusiform areas, which is stronger the more confident subjects were that they had seen a target. So, both the N2 and P3B appear to be signatures of consciously having seen a target. What does this mean? Here's a simplified schematic of how visual processing might lead to consciousness. Early visual input arrives at the back of the brain in occipital cortical area V1. Processing in V1 and related early visual areas, such as V2 and V3, appears to be associated with the EEG signals P1 and N1, all before about 200 milliseconds. 
mid-level visual processing associated with cortical areas further down the ventral stream and down the temporal lobe is associated with the N2 signal and later still the P3B signal, which is also evident in the frontal lobes. Visual perception appears to proceed in at least two stages. The first stage involves rapid and automatic operations whose outputs are briefly held in a high-capacity, parallel, short-duration, so-called iconic buffer. Here, pre-processed outputs are made available to attention for selection for more in-depth processing. The second stage involves transfer of attentionally selected iconic contents to the low-capacity visual working memory buffer. The visual working memory buffer permits temporarily extended access to what was presented even after it has disappeared from sight, as well as online manipulation of those contents. Attention is not only necessary for transferring attentionally selected iconic contents to working memory, attention is also required to maintain representations in working memory and to carry out further operations over them. In short, the output of automatic, stimulus-driven, early modular processing comprises a pre-compiled, pre-interpreted, and pre-evaluated account of events and objects in the world, as well as of states and needs of the body. These outputs are made available to brain areas that can make cognitive inferences and plan to do something given these facts, whether motorically or internally by, for example, volitionally shifting attention to them or exerting effort to recall facts about them from long-term memory. On this account, conscious experience, whether perceptual or imagined, is an internal virtual reality. In the case of perception, this construction is normally in such good correspondence with what is actually happening in the world in itself and in the body that, for the experiencer, it is as if the world in itself and the body were experienced directly and without delay. However, visual illusions, dreams, and hallucinations reveal that perceptual experience is not of the world in itself. Rather, such experience is constructed on the basis of ambiguous, sparse, and noisy sensory inputs mediated by numerous preconscious operations that are tantamount to an inference about what is likely going on in the world given the sensory data. But why are there qualia at all? Couldn't volitional operations be carried out without experience? Well, if information were not in a common qualia format, there would be no way to compare apples to apples against a common criterion assessing optimality of potential behavior. Having a highest level assessment of multiple lower system outputs in a common format permits the overall system to find a solution that maximizes global benefit to the animal as opposed to locally within the representational space of any submodule. A common format is required so that all submodules outputs can contextualize one another, can be time-stamped as occurring in the same moment, and can be stored in the quasi-experiential spatio-temporal format of episodic memory. If lower-level outputs were not in a common format, there might not be a single endogenous attentional tracking operator, say, that operated on all types of input, whether visual, auditory, motoric, or emotional. Having experience in a common qualia format allows executive planning, attentional, and working memory processes to have all relevant information about goings-on in the world and the body at one time. In the absence of a common format, the relevance or salience of an output from one module, say redness, might not be comparable to the output of another module, say hunger. The relative salience, importance, or priority would not be rapidly decidable. If there were multiple endogenous attentional operators, it would be as if multiple minds lived in the same brain, as may occur, actually, in split-brain patients. Executive processing and experience would be splintered. What was salient for one executive might have nothing to do with the priorities of another executive, even if they both operated over identical qualia. Executive decisions and therefore motor acts would likely conflict if there were more than one master endogenous attentional operator governing volitional acts. Finally, if outputs of different subsystems were not in a common format, it might not be possible to bind them into a common unit for attentional tracking. This shared format allows executive processes to consider, compare, track, and select from among possible courses of action in a unified way. In the absence of a common format for planning and executive operations such as endogenous attention to work on, there could be no hierarchical chain of command in volitional control of behavior. When there are multiple things in a cluttered display, attentional selection is required to be able to gain conscious access to the identity of any particular item. 
qualia comprise the representational format that can be bound into attentionally selectable and trackable objects. For example, one can listen to a symphony and choose to track the oboe. One can then listen to the same symphony again and this time choose to track the lead violin. In both cases, the sensory input is the same. What differs is what features are bound into a tracked figure and what remains unbound as the background against which the figure moves. On this view, consciousness or experience is that domain of representations that permits volitional or endogenous attentional tracking and manipulation over sustained durations. We're given an experienced object by virtue of attentional tracking that binds local features over time into that object or figure, whether an oboe in a symphony or a bird flying against a background of trees. It may be that lower level outputs are placed into a common qual format so that they all can be, but need not be, attentionally tracked in the next moment should the need arise. The link between qualia and volitional attention is very close. Qualia are those features that can potentially be volitionally, attentionally bound and tracked over time. And everything that can be so tracked, if need be, includes all current qualia, that is, all that is now experienced. But just because qualia evolved to be the operands of the volitional attentional tracking operator does not mean that they cannot exist in the absence of being attentionally tracked. A normal brain is typically endogenously binding some small percentage of uh, available qualia into tracked objects, and the rest, I argue, may be unbound in a state of qualia soup, which we experience as the background against which the tracked figure moves. If only conscious contents can be volitionally attentionally tracked, then consciousness or experience may conversely be the domain of representations that permit the possibility of endogenous attentional tracking and other forms of volitional manipulation. Consciousness, I would argue, is required for endogenous attentional allocation, shifting and tracking, volitional executive control, flexible cognitive processing, and manipulation of representations in executive working memory, complex concatenations of simpler mental operations, contextually appropriate management of detected errors, and effective top-down inhibition of imminent acts. Acts that follow these types of endogenous attentional executive operations over conscious operands, whether over external perceived operands or internal imagined operands, are potentially causal of the motor acts that follow from the conclusion of those operations. If volitional operations such as attentional tracking are only possible over conscious operands, we have free will because we are conscious. Moreover, consciousness is causal in the universe, not as a force, but because it affords mental operations that can lead us to then change the world. For example, we can imagine a flying machine and then go build what we have imagined in the world, changing the universe physically forever. Thus, the deepest source of free will is volitional operations over conscious operands, whether invisibly choosing to attend to this or that in the world, or carrying out volitional deliberations and mental manipulations in the domains of our imagination.